One, two, three, four. Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. Again. Again. Every week, without fail. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> it's incredible that you've gotten me here every single every single week. Yeah. Keep in mind, guys, though, though it is like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we were supposed to record this morning, but for some reason, Madison didn't show up, and then I'm like, good morning, and then four hours later, <laughs> she's like, good morning. I gotta say, one of my favorite moments of this week was we got a review. Thanks, you guys, by the way. To the people that do give us reviews, we love you guys if you give us good reviews. If not, then never mind. But one person gave us a review, and on the review, they're like, if I could give one teeny tiny critique, it would be to stop saying like so much. And that's me. That's literally me. I... I do not know why I do it, but like, instead of me... You just did it. But you guys, I had literally just finished threatening to wring Madison's neck for how many times she was saying like in our last recording. So we, we appreciate the feedback and yes... We hear you, and Madison is working on that. I, my <laughs> brain just doesn't move as fast as my mouth does or something. So we do appreciate people reviewing us and giving us comments and all of that. We love you guys. You guys are great. Yeah, no, for real. Yeah, and we scratched off our map. We have all of the U.S., Finally. Finally. So we got a new place in Canada uh, this week, which was... Oh, Prince Edward Island. Prince Edward Island, welcome aboard. Yes. Yeah, pretty cool. But anyway, we've had a lot of fun scratching off new places this week. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Yeah, it's really cool to see where you guys are all from. Anyway, but yeah, it's nice because we don't have as much opportunity to travel as we would like. So it's kind of cool that at least our stories and our voices are in places we want to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's someday, fine. someday our bodies will be there too. Hopefully, not our bodies like our dead bodies, but like our live bodies exploring. <laughs> I don't like how you worded that at all. I don't like it either. But yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing us on your stories and all of that. Keep doing that. We love it. Yes, tell your friends. Tell your friends. You guys are amazing. Today we're going to be talking about the Starved Rock murders. Not to be confused with the massacre that occurred in 1769. We're going to talk about that a little bit, too. But today we're talking about the massacre that happened in 1960. Yes. But first, we're going to give you a teensy bit of information on why it's called Starved Rock. Because it's kind of crazy. I mean, for a place to be called Starved Rock automatically yeah. just like doesn't sound... Does it make you hungry? I feel like it should make you hungry. No, it makes me just think of people being really skinny. (laughs) Because they're hungry. Because they're starving. (laughs) So basically, the massacre happened when two tribes battling over the murder of the Ottawa chief, one of the tribes sought refuge atop 125-foot sandstone. The other tribe waited them out at the bottom until they literally starved to death because they could not come off of the rock or be murdered. Damn. Yeah. So they even there's even reports of them trying to lower things to get water from the river down below, and the other tribe would just cut the vine of what they were bringing down to try to get their water. So they would attach like a bucket or something to a vine and try to lower it down to get themselves water, and the tribe would be at the bottom just chopping that bucket right off. Like, nope, no water for you guys. So that's how Starved Rock got its name. Okay, so on to our case today, and this case took place on March 13th, 1960. So we got an old one for you guys yes, today. Yes, we're going back, which is always good going back because it's cool to like see things. Right, but it's also hard to get more information sometimes when you go back that far or to or it's, verify. Yeah, or it's frustrating because of the technology they had back then. Oh, that's like, so hard, I know. It's so true. Okay, so this took place at Starved Rock State Park. This story is on three friends, Francis Murphy, who's 47, Lillian Oding, who's 50, and Mildred Lindquist, who's 54. They're all from Chicago, Illinois. All three were married, and two were even grandparents. 
I think they had something like nine kids between the three of them or something. Dang, that's impressive. So while at church one day, the women decided that they needed to take a little trip to kind of get rid of the winter blues. They all had kind of long winters. One of them, even her husband had had a heart attack. And so she had spent the entire winter like nursing him back to health, basically. They were all a member of the same church. They were all part of the same gardening club. They loved hiking and bird watching. So originally there were five women that were going to go on this trip, but two of them decided to stay home. Yeah, kind of a last minute decision, I think, because this was a last minute trip. This wasn't something they'd been planning for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like they had been talking about kind of taking a trip. And then on Sunday, they're like, let's just do it. And they left the next day. So then the three women went grocery shopping for their families and then headed out the next day. Very 60s, right? I got to stock up the fridge before I leave kind of thing. Although I usually do that too before I go. So it was a two hour drive and they were staying at Starved Rock State Lodge. So their plan was to spend about four days vacationing. Yeah, they just wanted to do some hiking, do some bird watching, relax. So Frances parked her gray station wagon. Lillian was put in room 109, and Frances and Mildred were put in the adjoining room of 110. Two of the women had brought books. Mildred brought her copy of the Field Guide to the Birds, appropriate since they are bird watching. Yes. Lillian brought a novel called Lincoln Lords. That sounds intriguing. And all three brought their knitting stuff. Is it stuff? Gear? Equipment? I don't know. What do you call knitting stuff? Well, I mean, it's just a ball of yarn and some those needles. But there's like multiple needles you probably need. I think there's well, different sizes. Two. Well, I guess it depends on what you're Wait, doing. Wait, is, is that quilting or knitting? Which, one, which one's one? There's like crocheting is one. Knitting is two. Crocheting? Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> So knitting yeah. is where there's two needles, I yeah. think. A- anyway, correct us if we're wrong on this, but what do you call knitting equipment? Needles and yarn? Yeah, I know, but like they brought their knitting stuff. They brought their knitting gear. Like what? I don't well, I don't know what to call it. I don't know. <laughs> but they're going to do some knitting. Yeah. So then they set off for a little hike. Uh, one of the women even remarked to a janitor walking by on their way out, what a beautiful day for a hike it was. But you basically yeah. go down to like where the frozen waterfall would be, and then you have to turn around and go back out. So it was a beautiful sunny day, and there was a light sprinkle of snow on the ground. And there are pictures of them like smiling and hiking and having a good time. So later that night, Lillian's husband, George, became concerned when his wife didn't check in. And I think one of the reasons he became concerned is because Lillian was actually really nervous about leaving him home alone because he's the one that had had the heart attack that she had spent all winter nursing him back to health. Okay. So she had assured him that she was going to check in. And when she didn't, he called her room, but there was no answer. So staff at the hotel suggested that maybe the women went out and that he should try again in the morning. So when he called in the morning, an employee told him that the women had been at breakfast and probably went out hiking and that he should try back later. Further attempts to get in touch with his wife all went unanswered. This is kind of unfortunate, the employee thinking that the women had been at breakfast because this kind of sets back their timeline a lot. That next day, a postcard had arrived for the women from a friend saying that she hoped that they were having a good time. The staff put the postcard in one of the room's boxes. He couldn't remember if it was 109 or 110, but he placed it in one of those boxes. Okay, on Wednesday, March 16th, it began to snow. The blizzard-like conditions made it very unlikely that anyone would be wandering about. Yeah, so what the hotel staff or the lodge staff have been saying is, well, they're probably out hiking. They're probably out doing this or out doing that. This kind of made it clear that maybe they weren't outside. George, Lillian's husband, was still unable to reach his wife. He called his brother and asked him to give it a try, stating that he was getting edgy. I think he was getting very frustrated that the staff was not able to find his wife. Uh, His brother, Herman, also had no luck. George then called Francis's husband, Robert, who also had the same results. It was insisted that employees check their rooms, and they found that their bags hadn't even been unpacked. Yeah, so at this point, the husband's like, look, I don't care what you're telling me, that she's fine, that they're doing whatever. I want you to go look in their room. They also discovered that the car was still in the parking lot, and it hadn't been moved. Yep. Uh, 
It is now that they realize the women have been missing for a full two days. So finally, the LaSalle County Sheriff is called in. I think the the ball dropped by this one was the hotel staff. Yeah, I kind of tend to agree with that. I think that the staff could have checked on them sooner. However, in the staff's mind, these women are there vacationing. Like, they even told the husband at one point, oh, a lot of times the women get together in other rooms. They play bridge. Like, they are just relaxing and trying to enjoy their time. I think it's the one employee that said that they were at breakfast. Which was obviously probably another group of women that he saw at breakfast. I I don't think it was intentional that they were trying to mislead the husband, but... Mm. So a massive search begins immediately, because these women have already been missing for two days. Yeah. They presume that the women simply had gotten lost or maybe fallen off a cliff and been injured. You know, at this point, they're still looking for... Missing hikers. Yes. I mean, this hike was only a mile, 1.2 miles, and it, it starts at the lodge. It's right... I mean, they're, they didn't go anywhere far away in order to do this hike. Shortly after the search begins, a newspaper reporter named Bill Daly got a tip and headed out to the scene immediately. Now, this becomes kind of important later on because with the reporter there, there's a lot of pictures that are taken... And the story is immediately able to be circulated. Yeah. It didn't take long for the women to be found. Mm. In your opinion, the three victims were brutally murdered. Is that correct? From my look at the scene uh, of the crime, uh, it would be my uh, best uh, judgment that they were uh, uh, assaulted and murdered. They were underneath a small ledge covered in snow. They were laying side by side on their backs. They were all naked from the waist down. In a horrible last act, their legs were left spread open. Their legs were also covered in bruises, and they were almost unrecognizable. So Mildred and Lillian were still tied together with heavy white twine. So there was now about six inches of snow covering the entire crime scene because now we have snow. So if the women had been found on day one, we would have really good access to this crime scene Mm -hmm. and have a better idea of what happened immediately. That is not the case. Police actually brought in low torches to melt the snow and ice, which I get that they have to see the crime scene. They have to get underneath it. This is also the 60s. It's also the 60s. But that seems kind of risky to me. Possibly that evidence could be destroyed by the melting of the snow. But what do I know? I don't know. There was a... Camera, a camera case, binoculars, and a tree branch all covered with blood. The camera case was torn like it had been torn away from someone. The camera, too, actually is an Argus camera, which I actually have this exact camera model, which is crazy. And it is a very heavy weapon, basically. Yeah. So the fact that it's covered in blood does not surprise me, but it is it is a very substantial, like, heavy camera. And I'll post pictures of that or of it, and I'll also do a little video showing you how it works because that becomes important later. Okay, so at some point, the husbands of Francis and Mildred had shown up, and investigators didn't know that it was them until the men broke down in tears at the sight of their wives' bodies. That is awful. I can't even imagine. Because there is a big crowd of people assembling at this point, right? Word has started to spread. There's reporters, there's people, and they're trying to deal with this crime scene. And there's just like people standing around watching. All three women died from skull fractures and brain damage. It appeared that they had been beaten with the branch that was found nearby. So it was believed that the women had been molested in some way, but due to the cold and the techniques available at the time, they could not tell if the women had been raped. So due to the lack of blood inside the cave and the large amount outside, police believed that they had been killed outside the cave and left there and then later moved into the cave. There was a trail of blood like they had been drunk. The time of death was believed to be shortly after they had left their hike. Police did not believe robbery was the motive since the camera and binoculars were still there at the time. The women had nothing of value on them. Right, so they had left everything valuable in their hotel room, and because the camera and binoculars hadn't been stolen, it was assumed that robbery was not the motive. 
Although I'm not sure I can completely buy that because the robber may not have known that they had nothing of value on them and maybe didn't take the camera binoculars because they ended up covered in blood and they panicked. So crime was really unusual in this area and people started locking their doors in fear, which what do we say? Always lock your door. Yeah. Just lock your door. Someone's just going to walk in. Yeah. Because they feel welcomed. Yeah. There was a lot of pressure to solve this case, especially with all the newspapers immediately reporting on it. Yeah. So not only is this a horrific crime, but they're also in the spotlight of the media almost immediately. And I've never seen a case, especially an older case like this, have so much media coverage from the onset. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. One weird thing, that postcard had gone missing. Yeah. So remember, the women would have been dead by the time the postcard had been delivered, Mm -hmm. but yet the postcard is gone now. They can't find it. The hotel can't find it. The police can't find it. It's missing. Interesting. So the suspect pool was very large in this case. More than 500 people worked in the park. More than 50 people were near or around the lodge at the time of the murders. Interviews and polygraphs were given. Everybody passed. Yeah, so this was uh, the 50 people who were staying at the lodge or near the lodge at the time or worked at the lodge were all polygraphed and all passed. They also took fingerprints, which is interesting. Keep that in mind. Because I never see anything about fingerprints in the future on this case. I'm thinking that they took fingerprints probably to make people more nervous. To make them think that they had evidence, possibly. So they actually had a lot of good suspects, and a lot of witnesses came forward. A gray station wagon had even been seen in the park on Monday that was of interest to the police. A package of keys were found. They call it a package of keys. In the news reports, they call it a key case, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. Is it keys? Is it a key case? What's a key case? I don't know. But nothing ever comes of either of these two reports. Once they'd gotten the photos back from the camera, one picture there appears to be what they thought was a blurry picture of a man in the background. Yeah, so I found this picture, and I'll post this picture. You guys can decide for yourselves, but it appears in one of the pictures of the... So it's one of the women, and in the background, you can see a blurry, shadowy, dark figure that people immediately thought was a person. So they're thinking, did the women catch a picture of their killer accidentally? They actually brought in groups of people, investigators and specialists, trying to determine whether or not this was a person in this picture or not. Okay. Right? I'm going to say, personally, I don't think it is. I don't know what this photo is. So I'm going to show Madison this picture because she hasn't seen it yet. I didn't see it. So it's basically one of the women posing. This is the shadow that they think is a person. Okay, first off, that's not a person. There's no way. Either I think it's the tree, but I think because it looks like there's there's overlay from another photo on the film. And to me, it looks like that the overlay from the photo had just distorted this tree that's in the original photo. Right. So So that's what I think happened. So with this particular camera, because remember, guys, I have this camera. I have physically used and printed film from this camera. Actually, I think I took pictures of Madison when she was a little babe with this camera. So it's really easy to over or underwind your film. So you have to manually wind the film for each picture. So you take the picture, you wind the film, you take Is it the, the picture. Gray one? No, it's the black one. Mm. So it's really easy to accidentally overlap the film from one picture to the next. But once the word went out that there might be a picture of the killer, news reporters ran with it. Everybody ran with it. And by the time police determined that they did not think it was a person in the picture, it word was already out. You can't unring that bell. But it's interesting because a lot of places where you read about this case, it talks about the man in the picture, and it talks about how two reporters went and tracked this man down, and he was determined to have been somewhere else at the time of the murders, which to me, 
doesn't even make sense. Because obviously this picture was taken right before the murders occurred. So how could that even be possible? And I read that in multiple sources. So explain that to me. And there's no way that's a person. But go look at the photo yourself. <laughs> yeah. On our, on our Instagram immediately. Because it'll be out by the time you listen to this. <laughs> Actually, I'll post it in our story too and we can do like a poll. Is it a person? Is it a tree? It's not a person. There's no way it's a person. It's definitely like some weird... But, but when you look at it, you can kind of see why people jump to that conclusion. I guess. <laughs> Madison. I guess. <laughs> okay. A maid also came forward and said that on the 15th, the day after the murders, she had discovered two damn towels on the floor of the bathroom, a wet soap. She also went to make the beds, but they hadn't been slept in. Yeah, except for one of the beds did have the blankets turned down and the pillow had an impression on it, like somebody had rested there. Which one of the girls could have laid exact, down. I was literally just going to say, you do. You like... Test out your bed. Oh my god! You when, lay we down. Were in, when we were in Europe, I would literally like throw my shit on the ground and then just face plant. Just if we face were in a hotel room, the bed. If we had a bed. <laughs> if I had a bed, like a good, even in the hostels. Yeah. So I sorry still, for Madison's dirty body print on the outside of the blankets because we were never clean when we got into those in those hostels. But also, the maid had said that there was like a dirt ring in the bathtub, like somebody had cleaned off in there. But I'm sorry, if you're just showering in the bathtub, why would there be a dirt ring? I find that really kind of strange. Unless and Maybe if the bathtub didn't drain fast enough. Or if they took a bath, but how dirty would this person have been? And could it have been dirty from the previous guest and maybe it wasn't cleaned very well? We don't know. But it looked like somebody had showered, for sure, in the room. Had the killer stolen their keys in order to clean up? Was anything taken from their hotel rooms? It appears that nothing was taken Which, from the I hotel mean, rooms. I guess... Lillian's room key has never to this day been found. So, I'm thinking that it is... I do think it is a possibility that the killer went to go clean up in their rooms. Like, he took their room key. But if that's the case, then that just solidifies even more that this was not a robbery. Because he did not take anything from the rooms. I don't think it's a robbery. I know. I Well, I struggle too. So, by this time, a $30,000 reward was posted by the companies that the husbands worked for. So each company chipped in to post this reward. Mm. Oh. So by the end of March, Warren, who is the state's attorney that's in charge of this case. Remember, he's a state's attorney too. He's not a sheriff. He's not a cop. Kind of weird. Not really sure why. Yeah. Doesn't seem like it's his job to be doing all the investigating, but anyway, that's where we're at. Warren, along with the LaSalle County Sheriff's Office, asked the government for more money to fund this investigation. To counter that request, the government threatened to suspend all funding on the case. They're like, you've already spent too much money, I'm mm-hmm. not giving you more money, that kind of thing. It was reported that 254 people had been interviewed, 2,115 leads had been tracked down, and the total man hours were around 21,000, costing taxpayers over $65,000. Yeah, so this has been an expensive investigation so far. And this isn't like the 60s, like this money? Yeah, that's a lot of money. Well, and not only that, but there's still a mass murderer on the loose. They have caught no one. So the pressure to catch somebody on this case is huge by this point, right? In July, Warren chose to launch his own investigation. Again, again, not not his his job. job. Yeah. So Warren brought all evidence back out. So he started thinking the only thing really left by the killer was this twine. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. We're in July now. Is that right? Yeah. Did we say July? They're just now thinking, oh, the killer left this twine at the scene. Maybe we can get something from it. So he actually bought a microscope with his own money and started examining the twine. In doing this, he was able to determine that the twine used for tying up the women, and there were two types of twine. Both of them were used at the lodge. Hmm. One in the kitchen and one in, like, other miscellaneous things. But the kitchen twine was very important because it was found to be the exact twine that they used in the kitchen. So they would use, like, this twine to tie up meat when baking it or when cooking it. And 60s. So this is back in the 60s. I though. think people still do that, though, sometimes. I don't know. That's don't know. weird. This meant that the murderer might have access to or work in the kitchen at the lodge. 
And they did do polygraph. So at this point, he's like, well, if this person had access to the lodge or the kitchen, they must work for the lodge or the kitchen, which means our polygraphs had to have been wrong because every lodge employee passed the polygraph. So Warren decides he's going to do a second round of polygraphs and he's going to bring in a different specialist. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about this, which part of a polygraph is read and interpreted by the person giving the exam. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, red button fail, green button passed, right? Like this... It's not really like that. It's not really like that. They can be up for interpretation. And also we know that they are not reliable, accurate, or even able to be used in a court of law. Well, like literally... And it's no different in the 60s. Yeah. He also brought in two detectives from county to work the case with him instead of using his own staff. He wanted two people that he could trust quote, to only report to him. So two reasons he might've been doing this, right? One, he needed people he could control or do exactly what he wanted, or he wanted to stop things getting leaked to the press because everything at this point leading up to this had been leaked to the press, right? So this was deputy Bill Dummett and Wayne Hess are the two detectives that are brought in. This brought Chester into the radar? Yep. So Chester Weger was a former dishwasher at the lodge. And when they brought him in for the second round of polygraphs, as he was leaving the polygraph, the person delivering the polygraph looked at them and said, that was your guy because he had failed the polygraph. After this, Warren was convinced that this was his man. And by this point, Chester had left the lodge to go into business painting houses with his father. So he was no longer working at the lodge at this time, but he had been working at the lodge the day that the women were murdered. Chester Weger was 21. He, like we said, was a dishwasher at the lodge. Which also, he was married with two kids. Two young kids. There was a case that came up. A 17-year-old girl at a nearby state park in 1959. Her and her boyfriend had been attacked. The boyfriend had been robbed. And the girlfriend had been raped. Right, so 1959. So this is just before the Starved Rock murders. Yes. So the girl and her boyfriend had also been bound with twine. Yep. So I think what happened was they're like, do you remember that case about the girl and the boy who had been tied up? She'd been raped. And they started thinking that maybe it sounded kind of similar. The boyfriend and girlfriend had gone to the sheriff's station to report this. And they were actually told that they didn't believe them at the time. So for some reason, some part of their story did not seem believable to police. This is 1960. I'm not sure what part of their story was not believable. So now looking back, the police are thinking we might have a suspect to this case, right? Mm -hmm. So they went to the woman and they showed her a bunch of mug shots. When she got to the picture of Chester, she began to scream. So they're like, is that a positive ID? (laughs) What do you mean by that? It's funny to me. So Chester had not really been on their radar earlier than this, right? Or previous to him failing his polygraph test. So it's all of a sudden he's now on their radar. They now have a witness. Now he failed his polygraph. Like everything seems to be falling in place for the police. But even back when this happened, when the Starved Rock murders happened, employees had said that Chester came to work with scratches on his face. What? How would he not have been on their radar? I'm going to play this clip for you guys. It's a news report of back in the day that specifically says police are looking for people who are in the area with scratches on their face. Yeah. So, listen to this. Earlier today, police set up roadblocks in and around Starved Rock State Park. They're looking especially for men with scratched faces. Faces clawed by three women fighting for their lives. But yet, Chester was not on their radar. Yeah. Okay. Kind of confusing. I'm kind of confused by that. Also, a love letter was written by him and was found torn up on the trail. Right. So I see this in a couple places. If that's true, though, why did it take months for him to become a real suspect? Or did they find the letter later? Was it found when the snow melted? Like, where this letter falls into place, I do not know. I don't understand. And it doesn't make sense, but I literally see it everywhere that this letter, this love letter... I don't even know who to, but written by Chester was found torn up on the trail. Yeah, 
so I don't know. I'm having trouble with I'm, the, I'm having trouble with that one. That. Yeah. But if you do any extensive research into this case, you will find that information. Uh-huh. And it's kind of confusing. He did cooperate with the police. He the entire time. Yeah. He surrendered his jacket. He did have a dark stain on it. Yeah, so he had this jacket that had like a dark stain on it, and he surrendered it. The stain did turn out to be human blood. But I'm sorry, would he not be completely covered in blood if he had murdered these women? They say that the women's injuries are consistent with like 100 blows from the stick. There's blood everywhere, right? So would he just have a couple dark stains on his jacket if he was the killer? I don't know about that. But And how big is this stain? What is this? Where is this stain located? I would I would like to see pictures of this jacket and of the stain. However, that just does not exist. Uh, he did take further lie detectors, and he did fail those as well. I think he took a total of three or four lie detectors altogether. You can literally just be under stress and fail them. Like, you and should be stressed out. Remember, he passed the first one. By September, Chester was on nonstop surveillance for over a month. Warren believed that he had enough evidence to arrest Chester, starting with the rape and robbery of the couple, right? Starting with that and then building his case from there. But there was a new problem. It was an election year. Elections were about to happen, and he was afraid that if he arrested Chester right before the election, that it would compromise the trial and that the defense attorney would say this arrest was only done to win the election because of the timing of it. He chose to wait until after the election to arrest Chester. What election is this? And this election is for the state attorney position that he's Mm. in, right? He does lose the election, FYI. So on November 17th, 1960, Chester was arrested for the rape and robbery of the two teenagers, the boy and the girl. Right. So the previous case that they think he's responsible for. After hours of interrogation and denial, he confessed to the murders. So this confession was to the murder of the three women at Starved Rock. After he was arrested for the rape and robbery of the girlfriend and boyfriend, they started interrogating him about the three women. The Starved Rock murders, yep. So his confession went like this. His mind was on robbery, not murder. He had gone down the trail, still unclear why he went down that trail. He says that he ran into the women near a bridge at the entrance of the canyon. He said that he tried to steal Lillian's, what he thought was a purse, but when he grabbed it, it was actually her binocular strap. He said that she started hitting him. He gained control of the women. He tied them up. Frances broke free and attacked him with her camera. Remember, heavy camera. Uh Uh-huh. Good weapon. He said that he grabbed the tree branch. Oh, this branch was three feet long and four inches thick. So remember, like we said, it's a a thick branch, and it's also kind of frozen, right? He said that he hit her in the head and then carried her back into the cave where Mildred and Lillian were tied up. Lillian got an arm free and started scratching and striking Chester. He said that he then hit her with the same branch and then he bludgeoned Mildred. So he said then that he drug their bodies into the cave because he had seen a red and white plane flying low near where he was and he thought it might be a police plane. So he had drug their bodies back into the cave. The police did verify that there was a red and white Piper Cub plane that had been flying low that day. They verified that the pilot had registered a flight plan and he said that he'd been checking out another airstrip nearby, like the condition of it, and that's why he was flying low through that canyon that day. Chester then went back to the lodge. So police had asked him why some of their clothing had been removed, and he said that he wanted police to believe that this was some kind of sex fiend that had committed these crimes. So he was basically saying he was trying to throw police off and that that was not his motivation at all, and that he did not actually molest the women, is what he's saying. So on November 18th, police had led him to the crime scene for reenactment. Right. So it's basically, they do like a reenactment where they film it, they do pictures, they document it. This can be really helpful in jury cases because if a suspect later recants what they say or later tries to back up and say, oh, I didn't actually do that, they have a video of them in their own words describing the crime scene and the murder, which is a really hard thing to dispute, especially with the jury. So 
the press came to this. So press were invited to this. I don't know if they were invited or if they just showed up, but I think they were invited. So press come. There's actually a lot of video and a ton of pictures from this. And during the whole process, Chester just looks kind of calm. He's just there and explaining, and that's it. We'll post some of them. It's very disturbing. I do, however, not love that this investigation was so much in the public eye. I feel like that puts a different level of pressure on investigators. They're no longer just trying to solve this murder. They're also trying to do it in front of the entire nation, right? Yeah. So after meeting with his court-appointed attorney for the first time, everything changed. Yep. So we're talking about Chester. So after this reenactment, after his confession, he finally meets with an attorney. <laughs> At this point, he recants everything that he said. He said that his confession was coerced, that he was threatened, and that he did not commit these murders. So remember, this is 1960. There's no video of the confession. There's no recording of the confession. There's no witness to the confession. And in fact, only one of the detectives were even in the room Mm -hmm. at the time of the confession. It was also reported to be late at night. I think something like past midnight, he hadn't slept and there were no Miranda warnings at this time. So Miranda rights didn't even exist until 1966. Crazy. Crazy. So police actually say that he knew details that only the killer would know. So he actually claimed that police had fed him information and even threatened him with a gun. So they had told him what to say. So what about those fingerprints, you know? They did take fingerprints. Yeah, so do we have fingerprint evidence? Because if we do, wouldn't that identify him as the killer or not at this point? I don't know. But... Never again do I see anything about the fingerprints. So you're right. That might have been a bluff. I think it was a bluff the to try to like... Or like, let's get fingerprints in case we find fingerprints later on, like yeah. on the camera or the binoculars or anything like that, Something. right? The trial begins on January 20, 1961. On February 7, Chester's three-year-old daughter, Becky, was actually banned from the courtroom because the judge thought that the jury might be swayed by her big blue eyes, her golden curls, and her winsome smile. Cool. Up until that point, his wife and kids were sitting in that courtroom every day. And his wife continued to sit in that courtroom every day after. So he had the support of his family at this point. So the jury was made up of seven women and five men. And on March 3rd, 1961, he was found guilty for the murder of Lillian. This actually happened on his 22nd birthday. Ugh, that's not a good way to celebrate your birthday. So the reason he was only originally charged with the murder of Lillian, this would give the prosecutor more options down the line for the other two murders. So say he's found not guilty, they could still try him for the other two murders in hopes of still getting a conviction. So this happens a lot where they might hold off some of the crime in order to protect the ability to try them down the road, right? Yeah. So he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. The prosecutor had been asking for the death penalty in this case, but the jury did not vote for the death penalty. And I think part of that is probably because Chester looks like he's 19. He's like a clean cut, young looking guy. He looks so young. He looks so young. And he's got his wife and kids sitting in the courtroom with him every day. So they voted for life in prison, but they did admit afterwards that they had no idea he would be eligible for parole. So it's kind of crazy that their option was life in prison with parole or the death penalty. There was no life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is kind of strange to me. Chester had been denied parole 24 times. Yep. And at 80 years old, he still maintains that he's innocent. Also, both police officers swore until the day they died that his confession was on his own volition. Yeah, so we've got Chester, 80 years old, still saying, I'm innocent. And then we've got two detectives who, until the day they both died, because they're both dead now, said he confessed we had nothing to do with coercing his confession. One kind of strange thing, there is a man who some thought helped Chester commit the murders. His name was George Spiros. He was actually the son of the owner at the lodge. His father had sent him to Europe after the murders, and he didn't return for years. 
Suspicious. Kind of strange, right? Police interviewed him at least five times. There was no evidence ever linking him to the case. And on May 2nd, 2005, George killed himself and his dog. Yeah, so two weeks before he killed himself, a document had actually been filed naming him as a possible suspect. Rather or not he knew about this document at the time of his death, we don't know. But kind of a weird Yeah. Situation. He went to Europe right after the murders, and then right yeah. after he was, like, suspected, he killed Right, himself. but again, if Chester's claiming he's innocent, he obviously can't point the finger at somebody else if somebody else was involved, right? Mm-hmm. But kind of a weird thing that does come up is this George Spiros character. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of leaning on the fact that I don't think he had anything to do with it. I feel like if there were two suspects in this case somebody would have broke by now. Especially Chester, who's been in jail for how long? And if he actually confessed to the murders, he'd have a better chance of getting out on parole. But because he's claiming his innocence and isn't taking responsibility for what he allegedly did, he's been denied parole. Yeah. So that's actually hurting him. So what I find weird is that he was coerced into confessing with the threat of death or whatever... He refuses to confess in order to save his life now and get himself out of prison. So I think that's kind of a weird double standard, but there's more. In the 80s, a woman had confessed on her deathbed that her and her friends had been at the park that day and that things had gotten out of hand and that people had been killed. Yeah, so two police detectives were called to her deathbed to hear the confession. Like she requested that police come to her deathbed. After admitting that she had something to do with these murders, her daughter cut the interview off and kicked the cops out of the room, saying her mom was crazy. The confession was never submitted in the courts. One of these officers came forward later saying that, oh yeah, that, that had happened, but there was no name of the person who had confessed. So at the time DNA testing was ordered, they failed to clear Chester because the samples had been contaminated. Uh, so after he was convicted and after his appeals were exhausted, the prosecutor had allowed school groups, civic clubs, and student journalists to handle and examine the evidence. There are a lot of people out there who think that Chester is innocent. Yeah, so there's two sides of this, right? There's the... People who are like, Chester's innocent. There's no way he did this. And there's people that are like, Chester's guilty. He definitely did this. I honestly I'm, can't even say one way I'm or the other. I'm not sure because I just, I don't know if there's exactly substantial evidence because I think that. Well, the evidence was his confession, right? Like, yeah. that's the big key evidence that they have against him. But he's saying that was coerced. So if that's true. Which is a total possibility. Like, I think part of me too wants him to be guilty because I I don't want an innocent man to have spent all this time in prison. That really freaks me out. But either way, whether you have an opinion or not, we feel like it could go either way. So don't Mm -hmm. yell at us if you disagree. Yeah, because I I feel like it could go either way if I'm honest. Yeah. I also don't think that his case, this case, would hold up in court today. I think that if this was the evidence presented today, it would probably fall apart. Yeah. Because I feel like there's reasonable doubt in this case. No, for sure. To me, looking at it now uh, from an outside view. In June 2007, Illinois governor denied Uyghur's clemency petition. So a clemency petition, if you don't know, is where a person who was convicted of a crime can either ask the governor of the state in which they were convicted or the president, if the conviction was in federal court, to grant them some sort of relief from the burden of their conviction. So this can be partial relief for part of their crime. This can be a full pardon. There are different levels to this. Mm -hmm. I couldn't really find the stats on how often this happens in Illinois exactly, but the Constitution places virtually no limitations on the president's power to grant clemency, which I think is kind of crazy. No, it's crazy. He can literally (laughs) look at anyone he wants and be like, you're free. Kind of interesting stats. So in 2007, which is the same year, 16 presidential pardons were granted. That would have been George Bush. Yep, so that was for George Bush. He granted 189 during his entire presidency. Seems like a lot to me. (laughs) Bill Clinton granted 396 during his presidency. That seems like a lot. 
Also, Barack Obama granted 212 during his presidency. Donald Trump, so far, has granted 25. (laughs) Anyway, kind of a fun fact. So, also in 2017, the last living juror, Nancy Porter, confessed that she still regretted convicting Chester. She didn't see how he would have been able to overpower the women since he was only 5'8 and of thin build. He was so short, I didn't even know that. I know, he looks kind of tall in the pictures because he's he's so lanky. Yeah, he's so scrawny. Yeah. She said that after six weeks of trial and hours of deliberation, she had given in to the other 11 jurors. But she has always thought that he was innocent. Yeah, that's another thing. That's a whole other thing is overpowering these women. Because, like, one of them hit the man with their But camera. he also had two of them tied up at the time. So, really, he only had to overpower one woman at a time. Because somehow I he guess. got them compliant enough to tie them up. Or tie a couple of them up, at least. So, I don't really know. Okay. So, on November 21, 2019, so last year, he was granted parole with a 9-4 to four vote. A 90-day stay was ordered by the Attorney General's office, so they wanted to conduct a risk assessment. They do this on sexual offenders a lot. So it basically determines whether or not they pose a risk and what the terms of their probation should be based on that. Okay. He was found to not be a risk. So after his release from prison, he said, in quotes, they ruined my life. They locked me up for 60 years for something I've never done. Uh, He also says that he wants to live out the rest of his days getting to know his grandchildren. So sad. If he's innocent. Well, that's the thing. It's so (laughs) sad if he's innocent. Like, I really do hope that he is guilty and he did commit these crimes. Because if he actually is innocent and he has spent 60 years. But, yeah. So, that's the Starved Rock Murders. We will post pictures. We will post some fun stuff, and you guys let us know what you think because we could really see either side of this, so don't yell at us if you have a strong opinion because I know that a lot of people do have a strong opinion one way or another in this case. We're not interested in fighting anyone or debating about it really, but we would love to know what, maybe we'll do a poll on our Instagram, we would love to know what the majority of people think in this case. Because I'm really curious, because when I initially started reading about this case, I was like, oh, he's innocent, because a lot of the information out there comes from from people supporting his innocence. And as I read into it, as I did more research, I was like, I'm really just not sure. Well, I'm just not sure, because basically the largest evidence that he was convicted on would be his confession, which... Which, if that's true or not, we don't know. Yeah, because like... And I honestly, I feel like the only chance we have of really knowing what happened in this case could be a deathbed confession from Chester himself, or we will just never know. There is a lot of material out there if you guys want to do more research on this case or want to see more. There's a ton of pictures. We will post some of them. American Hauntings wrote a story on this case. Uh, There's a book called Starved Rockets by Steve Stout. The podcast Morbid did an episode on this case as well. Okay. I, I like think I remember from I like, back in the day. I like Yeah. Them. Yeah, they're good. Fucking A. Them, she's going ham. She's angry. Going ham? Yeah. I've never heard that before. You've never heard that no. before? No. Going that, ham? Is that like just mad? What is that? Crazy? Like going hard. Like going ham? Are you ham at something? Okay. Well, Phoenix is going ham right now, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I literally can't even say that. It feels weird. <laughs> So if you hear screaming in the background, the five-year-old is very upset about something upstairs. But we're not going to worry about that. That's not my problem. Yeah. Thanks for listening. And thanks for uh, being amazing. We love you guys. Come back and listen more. Madison, and listen to our other episodes. Yeah. Madison's going to continue working on not saying like. Yeah. God. One of also, these- sorry my voice is so annoying because we also got a negative comment about that, about our we, annoying voices. We did. It's so bizarre. We got this comment I was like, or this review saying good cases or something like that, but I can't handle their annoying voices. We, we need to get tougher skin. You guys, go say nice things about us. We're struggling today. <laughs> Let's get Instagram poll. Do I have an annoying voice? Anyway, go say nice things about us so that we feel better. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, I know you can do reviews on there. I don't know about other but platforms. But we, we would honestly love more reviews on all of our things. And 
anything you guys have to say, we would love to hear about it. Except for if my voice is annoying, please don't tell me. Yeah, and if you have, like, negative critique for us, you guys can always message us, too. You don't have to put it like like, in a public forum (laughs) also the thing that i'm seeing is like i'm fine with people like critiquing our podcast you know like there's things that we obviously could do better oh obviously like me saying like every five seconds and we actually i actually really we appreciate no we do that but like we've had some some interesting ones just about like just like things that i'm like someone's really gonna just say that that's fine. Yeah, people can be really mean. That's cool. I know. And, and overall, we have a lot more positive than negative. Than negative, but, but it's hard to ignore the negative. So we're struggling a little I'm bit with that. Okay. Fine. <laughs> you say what you want. I'll just keep doing my podcast. <laughs> keep. You'll have to listen to it. I didn't force you to listen to it. Follow us on Instagram, Lost in the Woods Podcast. Yep. Follow us on Facebook or like us on Facebook. Do you follow on Facebook? I don't know. You like you're the old person. You're supposed to know more about Facebook. You had Facebook long before I did, honey. I'm not sure. Exa- like us on Facebook, Lost in the Woods podcast. Yeah, tell your friends. We would love more listeners, always. And we will be getting our Patreon started soon, so there will be bonus things, cool. Yeah, so we're things. we're already starting to work on our bonus things now for later because they are the way that we're planning on doing them. They are more time consuming, and mm-hmm. there's a lot more content to them. So know that we're working on that, but we won't be launching it until we feel like we have but some ready. material ready. Get ready. But because get ready. it's coming out. <laughs> it's going to. It's going to be there. All right. Well, we love you guys, and thanks for listening, and have a wonderful day. Adios. Adios. Bye, guys. Bye.